Good evening. Today we meet again with Anatoly Fomenko. And we will talk about the method of form codes and application to identify duplicates of historical personalities. In the Multimedia Museum of the New Chronology in the hall dedicated to the Epic of Christ, there is a module that explains the method of form codes. In the module, Comparative Biography of Jesus Christ and Byzantine Emperor Andronikos I Komnenos on interactive screens, the most significant similarities in their biographies are presented. Also, in this hall, visitors can learn who calculated the date of Christ's birth and when the contemporary method of recording dates appeared. Anatoly Timofievich, hello. Hello, Svetlana. I'm glad to see you. Glad that we are meeting again to talk about our new chronology museum in Yaroslavl. Anatoly Timofievich, in our previous conversation, you talked about your proprietary methods of dating ancient and medieval events, including the method of form codes. Today, I would like to ask you to talk about the application of this method using the example of duplicates of the most famous historical figure, Jesus Christ. Our current podcast is dedicated, once again, to one of the halls of our museum in Yaroslavl. You see our museum in Yaroslavl. It contains a lot of information about the new chronology, and our books are presented there. As an important theme in our museum, there is a special hall that discusses Andronikos Christ and the duplicates associated with him. Today, I want to talk about this theme, and it's important because it is one of the applications, one of the methods that we have developed. In previous discussions, we briefly mentioned the methods of dynastic parallelism and frequency damping. There is another method called the method of form codes, which allows us to compare biographies of medieval and ancient figures and also identify duplicates. It complements the previous methods and, as it turns out, works well with them. Let me briefly explain what we're talking about, what kind of form codes were introduced, and how they are used. During our research, we processed many historical biographies. We developed the form codes table, which consists of 34 items, some of which contain sub-items. It is a very detailed form that covers the entire biography of the subject under study. Firstly, gender, male or female, lifetime. We need to determine and include in the form code table the reign duration, social status, and position held by the subject under study. In historical chronicles, these could be kings, emperors, military leaders, politicians, public figures, religious leaders, bishops. The next item is death of a ruler. We need to carefully investigate the details. Natural death in a peaceful environment, killed on a battlefield, assassinated as a result of a plot. It is highly desirable to include exotic circumstances of death in this form. It is essential to study major natural disasters, if they are described, and include them in the form. Famine, floods, epidemics, earthquakes, eruptions of volcanoes. In what year did these events occur? Everything should be included in the form. Next, astronomic phenomena coinciding with the reign or life of the subject. Wars during the ruler's reign, the number of wars. It is very important to note the temporal characteristics of these wars, when they started and when they ended. The time interval between different military conflicts in the subject's life should also be noted. Then, it is necessary to assess and include in the form, for example, 
the scale of the war according to Chronicles. The simplest way to assess the scale of the war is by the number of lines dedicated to it in the Chronicles. The larger the war, the more detailed its description. In other words, the number of lines and pages is a good parameter indicating intensity of the military conflict. Next, the number of participants in the war should be included. List adversaries, neutral forces, mediators. Item 13. Geographical localization of the war, where it took place. This is also important for comparing biographies near the capital, in the capital, within the state, outside the state, internal or external wars. The result of the war, victory, defeat, or uncertain outcome. Peace treaties, conclusion of a peace treaty with, for example, an uncertain outcome of the war, conclusion of a peace treaty after a defeat. Next, extra item, seizure of the capital, seized or not seized. The fate of the peace treaty, broken or not broken. The exact circumstances of the conquest or collapse of the capital. It is very useful to create a map of the military campaigns during the war. This is an important geographical parameter. Participation of the ruler in the war, plots during the ruler's life, geographical localization of wars, revolts, plots. The name of the capital, translated into different languages is very useful. Moreover, it is beneficial to consider all names without vowels, leaving only the consonant core. In old texts, names were mostly written without vowels, and this is an important factor. The name of the state, geographical localization of the capital, legislative activity of the ruler, reforms in their nature, new code of laws, and restoration of old laws. A list of all ruler names with translations. Ethnic affiliation of the people, tribe, clan. Foundation of new cities, capitals. Religious situation, such as introduction of a new religion, struggle between sects, which exactly, religious revolts and wars, church councils, ecclesiastical convergences. The 33rd item, dynastic struggle within the ruler's clan. The last item, the 34th, remaining facts of the biography. Obviously, historical biographies can be very diverse and complex. There are facts that are difficult to anticipate in advance. These need to be extracted and collected in an additional 34th item. So, we get a form code table. We briefly went through its main items. In our methods, we didn't compare just one table, but compared the form code flow, a sequence of form codes that corresponded to a dynasty of rulers. In the dynastic method, we usually considered about 15 to 20 rulers. An individual form for each of them needs to be compiled. We refer to it as the flow of form codes. Then, in addition to comparing dynasties based on the ruler's personalities, we compared these flows of form codes. This is a very important parameter. It allows us to delve into the chronicles, anticipate the substantive events of the biography. What was discovered? It was found that if the form code flows of two dynasties are not very different from each other, they usually represent the same real dynasty. But if the two form code flows differ significantly, then the corresponding actual dynasties are different. A special coefficient was introduced to numerically compare form code flows, similar to how it was explained when analyzing rain durations. I won't go into details of the coefficient, but there is a measure that allows numerical evaluation of how close or distant two-form code flows are.
In a nutshell, this is the idea of this method. It allows us to delve deeper into the biographies than we did by analyzing rain durations or frequency of references and name repetitions. Now, let's move on to the application of this method. Over a fairly long period, we analyzed many form codes of biographies of various figures. Today, we will talk about Andronikos Christ and Andrei Bogolubsky. Andrei Bogolubsky is a famous grand prince, and Andronikos Komnenos is a well-known Byzantine emperor. Both biographies belong to the second half of the 12th century, and as a result of applying our methods, it was discovered that these biographies duplicate each other, meaning they largely describe the life of the same character. During his time in Russia, he is reflected in our chronicles as the Grand Prince Andrei Bogolubsky. During his time in Tsargrad, he is reflected in Byzantine chronicles as Emperor Andronikos Christ. I repeat, this is the second half of the 12th century AD, and the date of his life, which we calculated and will briefly discuss below, is 1152, 1185, born in the year 52, the mid-12th century, death by crucifixion at the end of the 12th century, in the year 85. In the course of our research, we discovered a significant number of duplicates of this great character in the history of humanity. Why are there so many duplicates? It's understandable. The larger the event, the more it generates its reflections on the pages of chronicles, in stories, legends, and tales. In this case, this biography has produced over a hundred duplicates. To date, 124 of them have been found. Even today, we see this in modern life. The larger the event, the more it attracts references, repeated discussions, stories on television, radio, and the Internet. This is natural. Significant events attract attention of a large number of listeners and viewers. The same happened in antiquity. Let's quickly go through this list. We will return to it at the end of our presentation. Right now, we will just mention some names. Some of them may be familiar to you, while others may not. These are duplicates of the phantom reflections of Andrei Bogolubsky and Andronikos Christ. Many literary characters, Dr. Faust, Till Eulenspiegel, Hodja Nasreddin, priest from Kallenberg, priest Amos, priest Helmbrecht. In Russian history, Igor Olgovich, John Lagos, Pope Gregory VII Hildebrand, Rudolf Swabian, Edward the Confessor, Romanos Diogenes, Isaac I Komnenos, Michael Caliphates, Romanos Argyros, Hamlet, Macduff, Jero, Kolyada, Santa Claus, Odin, Death of Oleg, Prince Igor, Prince Eskold, Hero Svitigor, Hero Tristan. In the history of the Incas in America, Kings Manco Capac, Manco Capac II, Viracocha, Ir Kachi, Wanakavi Pirwa, Inca Roca, partially the Prophet Muhammad, Emperor Phocas, King Arthur, the Sorcerer Merlin, Queen Guinevere, the famous Saint Basil the Great, the famous church figure Apollonius of Tyre, Emperor Heliogabalus, Commodus, alias Verus. On the right side of this slide, there are black dots. 
These are the datings where the Scaligerian chronology erroneously placed phantom reflections of the biographies of Andrei Bogolubsky and Andronikos Christ. These duplicates spread along the timeline. There are many of them, there are clusters and many were pushed into the distant past. Currently, we are somewhere in the vicinity of the phantom 1st and 2nd centuries AD. Continuing, Roman emperors, alias Varus, partially Hadrian, Domitian, Apollonius of Tyana, Apostle Andrew I called, about whom we will talk specifically, Jesus Christ, considered to be from the 1st century AD. A well-known character from the works of Flavius Josephus, whom he referred to without a name as follows. A man by appearance, but his deeds were divine. Roman emperors Octavian Augustus, Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, then well-known figures, Euclid, Titus Andronicus, partially Alexander the Great. And now we go even further down the timeline. This is before the Common Era, roughly the 4th or 5th century BC. Well-known names, Socrates, Nicias, Pausanias, in Greek history. King Cyrus the Younger, Timocrates, Phrenicus, Aristeus, Cleomedes. I will skip some. In the history of Iran, Persia, Kings Kiamars, Siamak, Jamshid, Mardis, Zahak, Faradin. In ancient Greek history, Polycrates, Zopyrus, King Cyrus the Great. In the history of Persia, Iran, the famous character Zarathustra or Zoroaster. Pythagoras, King Romulus, Roman Empire. Biblical characters, Isaiah, David. In Egyptian history, the god Osiris. In Slavic history, the god Salmoxus. In ancient Greece, the god Dionysus. Characters, Orpheus, god Zeus, Jason, god Apollo, Marcias. Biblical characters, Esau, Jacob partially. Ancient Greece, Orestes, Radamanthus, god Asclepius, also known as Esculapius, Hercules, Heraclius. Homer's character from the Odyssey, Patroclus, Theseus, the famous ancient hero, god Bacchus, Polydorus, the phoenix bird, god Mithra from Eastern mythology, partially Buddha, partially Krishna, and several other heroes and characters in Egyptian and Roman history. We briefly went through the list of duplicates, it's enormous, with over a hundred names. This was a very extensive work because the form codes method was applied to each of these biographies. And by comparing the numerical coefficient, it was found that these form codes align very well with the form codes of Andrei Bogolubsky and Emperor Andronikos Christ. And now I want to talk about why the idea arose to study the form codes of Prince Andrei Bogolubsky and Emperor Andronikos Komnenos in Byzantine history. First, we needed to pinpoint a specific era, discover a date where it felt possible to find duplicates. How were these dates discovered? Other our methodologies were used for this. We briefly discussed this, and it is well presented in our museum. There is a special hall where this is explained in detail. Based on the methodology of dynastic parallelism, it was discovered that two dynasties are phantom reflections of the same actual dynasty. On the right is the ancient Roman dynasty of the Roman Empire from the 1st century BC to the 3rd century AD.
and on the left is the dynasty of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, supposedly from the 10th to the 13th century AD. On the right and left are rulers that overlapped with each other. The time shift between these two dynasties is 1053 years, or approximately a thousand years. Let's pay attention to the following duplicates. On the right, we see Germanicus, followed by the next rulers, Tiberius, Caligula. On the left, we see Emperor Conrad the Salic and the subsequent Emperor Henry III the Black. Their eras overlapped, and their biographies turned out to be duplicates. So, during the time of Germanicus and Tiberius, Caligula, in the traditional version of history, we see Jesus Christ, the first century AD, traditionally considered from around 0 to 33 AD. On the left, we see Gregory Hildebrand, Gregory VII, the famous Roman Pope, in the mid-11th century AD, the years of his rule, 1053, 1085. Thus, based on the method of dynastic parallelism, the biography of Gregory Hildebrand overlapped with the biography of Jesus Christ from the first century. But don't think that Hildebrand's biography is the original. As mentioned at the beginning, the original is the biography of Prince Andrei Bogolubsky and Emperor Andronikos Komnenos. Hildebrand's biography is a duplicate that resulted from a shift downwards by 100 years. It's a kind of phantom. It stands 100 years below the era of the original. This was the first argument that showed the need to study events of the 11th and 12th centuries AD. Look at the same dynastic overlap. Here, you can clearly see how these duplicates are arranged in Scaliger's textbook on medieval and ancient history. The diagram marks the era of Gregory Hildebrand, the mid-11th century. Below is the era of Christ, the 1st century AD. Here, the shift down by a hundred years is marked to the middle of the 11th century from the mid-12th century, where the biographies of Andronikos and Andrei Bogolubsky are located. Now let's look at the famous story related to the biography of Christ. It's the famous Star of Bethlehem, a luminous explosion of a star that marked the birth of Christ. The question arises, and this will be our next step. Is there something similar, namely an explosion of a star, in the biography of Gregory Hildebrand from the mid-11th century? It turns out that there is such an event in the modern Scaligerian textbook, and it is well known. It's the supernova explosion that created the Crab Nebula. Traditionally, this event is associated with the 11th century. Therefore, it is natural that when studying the form codes methodology, we included this explosion in the table that was mentioned in the beginning of this lecture. It is believed that the supernova of the Crab Nebula appeared in the mid-11th century. In reality, as further detailed study of this issue revealed, the explosion occurred in the mid-12th century, a hundred years later, precisely when the Form Codes method discovered the biographies of Andrei Bogolubsky and Andronikos Komnenos. Apparently, the fact that the Crab Nebula is a supernova remnant was first pointed out by astronomers, not historians. The date 1054 is mentioned in Chinese chronicles, but as we separately mentioned,
These are late chronicles and they are not independent sources. It turns out that in this case the explosion can be dated purely astronomically, and with a high degree of accuracy. Let's see if this information aligns with the method of form codes and the method of dynastic parallelism. Let me explain what this is about. The appearance of a supernova is an explosion in space. After the explosion, the star's remnants spread out from the site of the catastrophe. During the first few thousand years, the speed of the debris dispersion can be considered uniform. Since all of this happens in the vacuum of space, collisions with individual cosmic objects and dust only have an impact over large intervals of time. Therefore, it can be assumed that there is gradual, perhaps slight, deceleration of the debris dispersion after the supernova explosion. This leads to a simple and reliable method for absolute dating of the star explosion. Specifically, one needs to measure the speed of the debris spreading in our time and the distance they have traveled from the place of the explosion. By dividing the distance by the speed, we obtain the time of spreading. By counting the resulting time back, we get the date of the explosion. Moreover, modern instruments allow us to do this with high precision. The dating of the supernova explosion was carried out in 1942 by the astronomer Walter Bade, based on Duncan's results, and it was described by me. By dividing the distance, the path of dispersion, by the speed measured today, we get the date. Counting down, we obtain the dating of the explosion. This is what Bade did. He found that the age of the Crab Nebula is 758 years. Subtracting this date from 1942, we get approximately the mid-second half of the 12th century AD, not the mid-11th century when Scaliger's chronology suggests the supernova explosion. This dating was significantly refined by the American astronomer Trimble. She recalculated the speed of the debris dispersion. I want to show you relevant images. Let's look at numerous depictions of the Star of Bethlehem in old images, paintings, and icons. There is a vast number of images of the Star of Bethlehem, its appearance marking the birth of Christ. There are many pictures and images of it. We are showing some of them. Here is the supernova explosion in the upper left corner, appearance of the Star of Bethlehem. Here's another depiction of a star that illuminates the infant Jesus from the heavens. Here are other well-known paintings. At the top, you can see the star. Sometimes, later artists depicted this star as a comet. In this case, the star is shown with a tail. Its beam extends not downwards but sideways, as if it were a comet. Here's an enlarged image. This image shows a star or a huge explosion in the sky. Here are more old images of the Star of Bethlehem. There is a plethora of its images. Here's another bright image. Angels, starburst. This is a fragment of the painting. I'm not showing it in its entirety. At the bottom, naturally, is the Nativity of Christ, the beam of the star of Bethlehem falls on infant Jesus. Now let's return to astronomy. Here is a diagram of astronomer Trimble's analysis of the speed of supernova debris scattering in the Crab Nebula. This is a special projection onto the viewer's eye with a perpendicular direction to the major axis of the Crab Nebula. 
And this is a similar projection onto the minor axis. You can see the scattering trajectories. So, what did astronomer Trimble find from the analysis of these diagrams and this information? It turns out that the star explosion occurred around the year 1140 AD with an accuracy of plus or minus 10 years. That's fairly precise. Thus, Trimble's conclusion is very straightforward and essential. The measured proper motions of the star debris do not lead to the alleged historical date of 1054 AD. The supernova in the constellation Taurus exploded between 1110 and 1170 AD. In other words, it's the mid-12th century AD, not the mid-11th century AD. This is how astronomy confirmed the conclusion drawn from the method of form codes and the method of dynastic parallelism. Let's continue. Let's see what other data indicated the mid-12th century as the time of the life of Andronikos Christ, Andrei Bogolubsky. This is the famous subject that we discussed in our stories. It is represented in our Museum of the New Chronology in Yaroslavl. This is the dating of the Shroud of Turin. It turns out that this dating perfectly corresponds to the astronomical dating of the Star of Bethlehem. I will remind you that the Shroud of Turin is a length of linen cloth that has come down to us, and into which, it is believed, the body of Jesus Christ was wrapped after crucifixion. In the 20th century, an important experiment was conducted. Radiocarbon dating of this fabric was carried out. Traditionally, it is associated with the 1st century AD. However, radiocarbon dating performed by several laboratories showed that this was not the case. And this fabric dates back to the period between 1050 AD and 1350 AD, i.e., from the 11th to the 14th centuries. Moreover, the center of this dating interval can be considered the dating carried out by the Oxford Laboratory. It was better grounded and provides an interval of approximately 1160 to 1190 AD, which again, is the mid-second half of the 12th century. There has been excellent agreement on the independent radiocarbon dating of the Shroud of Turin. I will remind you, this is the Turin Cathedral where this shroud is kept today. Inside the cathedral, there is a special case. This is the unfolded shroud. Usually it is folded up, and visitors do not see it. It is unfolded on rare special dates, and visitors are allowed access to it. Let me remind you what it looks like. Here is a photograph of the shroud. The shroud depicts a negative image, and this was transformed into a positive image by inversion. As it is believed, it was the naked body of Jesus Christ, covered with a cloth. This is another picture. Taken in a different spectrum, this is the overall view of the shroud. It covered the body from above and below. Below you see a top view of the body, and above is the back. 
I repeat, it covered the body from above and below. This is an enlarged image of the face, the head in the shroud of Turin. This is another image, slightly in a different spectrum to make it stand out more clearly. This shows how the shroud was photographed and the beginning of the investigation of this shroud. A lot of work was done in the 20th century. This is an ancient image of how the body of Christ was covered with the shroud when he was taken down from the cross after the crucifixion. Another ancient image of the shroud unfolded. It shows angels lifting the shroud. On the right is a top view of the lying body, and on the left is a view of the back. Let's reiterate that based on the radiocarbon dating of the shroud in the laboratories of Oxford, Arizona, and Zurich, it can be concluded that the likely date of the shroud's manufacture falls between 1090 and 1390. The dating range from Oxford, with the least dispersion, is the most probable, roughly from 1090 to 1265. Dating the shroud to the first century is impossible, and all experts agree on this. A few more words about the shroud. We are sometimes asked why, in this case, you trust radiocarbon dating of the shroud but in your books, you criticize the application of the radiocarbon method by modern archaeologists and physicists. We have explained this. I will briefly clarify. Today's application of this method, unfortunately, needs a re-evaluation because it presupposes a priori knowledge of Scaliger's dating for the studied artifacts. Historians and archaeologists provide physicists with a preliminary dating, and physicists must slightly refine this historical dating. Therefore, although the foundation of the method is very reasonable, this method is good. Today, the radiocarbon scale needs to be retested. However, the situation with the shroud is special due to its particular significance for the history of the church and civilization as a whole. Radiocarbon dating was carried out by three laboratories very carefully. Many measurements were made in each laboratory. This is precisely what we insist on today. As we can see, the result was unexpected for archaeologists and historians. Instead of the first century, it turned out to be approximately the 12th century AD. A few words about the shroud. In Russia, the savior not made by hands is known. Researchers have long noticed that the shroud is well documented in Western European history but not in the history of Eastern European countries, even though it is believed to have been brought from Constantinople, which is in the East. It's quite strange that in the history of the Eastern Church, there is almost no information about the Shroud of Christ. However, I can tell you that every Russian Orthodox Church has its own Shroud, and important ceremonies associated with it exist only in the Russian Church. They are not found in the West. From the legend of the Shroud of Christ, it's unclear where it was originally kept and to whom and when it was displayed. In Byzantium and Russia, another revered relic is well known, the Savior not made by hands. In the Russian language, it's also commonly referred to as the Ubris. Some researchers, predating us, have long held the idea that the Shroud and the Ubris were the same object. Therefore, in Russian history and in the history of the Church, the Shroud is known as the Savior not made by hands. 
Pay attention to the fact that we see the face of Christ in Russian icons of the Savior not made by hands. Apparently, the shroud was kept in a way that only the face of Christ was visible. It was folded. Interestingly, today's shroud, which is in Turin and measures 4 meters, was folded four times so that the face of Christ would be in the center. This is exactly what we see when looking at icons of the Savior not made by hands, an image that is well known in Russia. It is depicted in every Russian church, and a special holiday in the Russian church is dedicated to it. The Savior not made by hands is, in general, one of the most famous icons in Russia. Here are some icons I'm showing you. There are many more, and we are all familiar with them. Apparently, from the perspective of the new chronology, the picture is as follows. This once again leads us to the 12th century, as suggested by the methodology of the form codes. Apparently, the Shroud of Turin is a non-handmade image, an original from the 12th century. It was in this cloth that the body of Christ was wrapped in 1185. We will discuss the date in more detail below. Apparently, it was kept in Russia for some time. Here, the shroud was kept folded, so that only the face, which was depicted in Russian icons, was visible on the surface. Since the shroud was initially in Russia, most of the icons of the not-made-by-hands image were painted by Russian icon painters. Similar images were not widespread in the West. Nevertheless, Western artists imagined the story of the shroud but somewhat differently. For example, let's take a look at Albrecht Dürer's famous engraving. In the Western European tradition, this well-known subject is called the Veil of Veronica. In reality, what we see is the shroud, folded so that only the face of Christ is visible. By the way, it has long been noted, not by us, that in this case, the name Veronica is more of a colloquial portmanteau, meaning faith plus icon. In other words, the true image, the perfect image, the truthful representation. This is how the shroud, also known as the Savior not made by hands, is reflected in Western European tradition. Let's continue. Through radiocarbon dating of the Shroud of Turin, we once again arrive in the 12th century. Furthermore, the 12th century for dating the lives of figures like Andrei Bogolubsky and Andronikos Komnenos arises with a completely different approach to the analysis of ancient sources. We briefly discussed this earlier. Allow me to remind you in a few words. It's about the round Dendera zodiac, the zodiac of Osiris. It was discovered in Egypt, in the famous Dendera temple. We have conducted its dating. I remind you that this is ancient Egypt, the temple of Dendera. Regarding this zodiac, we have a special study presented in the book, The New Chronology of Egypt. Here is the image. This zodiac was deciphered and dated by us, and it provides the Easter date, the morning of March 20, 1185 AD. Once again, it perfectly aligns with the dating of the Star of Bethlehem. We obtain another independent astronomical dating of the life of Christ. To date, we have dated several dozen ancient zodiacs, including all those known before. And we have also discovered many new ancient images that have also been dated.
Among those dated Zodiac, there is only one that precisely gives the date of the Jewish Passover, i.e., the first full spring moon. This is precisely the famous round dendera zodiac, or as it is also called, the zodiac of Osiris. This is an image of the zodiac of Osiris, depicted by Napoleon's artists during his famous campaign in Egypt. The dendera zodiac is depicted. It's round in shape, it is depicted by the artists. A very accurate description. The famous album published during Napoleon's time contains invaluable images of ancient Egyptian monuments, as seen by Napoleon's soldiers, archaeologists, and artists. This is another image of the Zodiac of Osiris from the same album. On the left is the Zodiac in the Dendera Temple, and on the right is the Egyptian goddess Newt. Further to the right, she is depicted as the symbol of the celestial sky, encompassing the starry sky. This is also a representation of the round zodiac in Dendera, so that you can see more clearly the constellations, which, by the way, are depicted the same way as today. Here you can see Leo, Virgo, Scorpio, Pisces, Gemini, and planets. Now there will be a more detailed image. Please take a look, here the zodiacal constellations are marked in red. Just like today, we see them depicted in the same way on medieval star charts from the 16th to 18th centuries. For example, Taurus, Aries, Pisces, Aquarius, Capricorn, Sagittarius, Gemini, Virgo and so on. In addition to them, planets are depicted as wayfarers with staffs. They are marked in yellow. Here are wayfarers with staffs, they are the planets. The zodiac is deciphered, and this date, this celestial clock on which the date is recorded, is dated. As I mentioned, this date is 1185 AD. The god Osiris is yet another phantom reflection of Andronikos Christ, Andrei Bogolubsky. We discussed this at the very beginning when we were discussing the list of duplicates discovered using the method of form codes. Thus, we obtain another, a third completely independent dating of Christ's life confirming the astronomical dating of the star of Bethlehem in the mid-12th century. To reiterate, we have discovered the Easter Egyptian zodiac, which bears a date that deviates precisely by 33 years from the dating of the star of Bethlehem, which announced the birth of Christ. I remind you that the traditional view is that Christ lived for 33 years. So counting 33 years upward from 1152 AD, we arrive at 1185 AD, which precisely matches the dating of this famous round dendera zodiac, which is also the Easter zodiac. Therefore, we come to the conclusion, a hypothesis, actually not a hypothesis, but a more reliable statement, that comparing with the previous dating, we found that this zodiac was created and dedicated to the date of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's March 1185 AD. Let's continue. Another very interesting confirmation of the dating of Christ's life in the mid-12th century. To reiterate, what the form codes method, the method of dynastic parallelisms, astronomy, the Bethlehem star, the dating of the zodiac of Osiris, and the radiocarbon dating of the Shroud of Turin all point to. Another fact is the dating of events according to the Pelea. This is an independent direct dating from an ancient source. Pelea is an ancient source. 
It is somewhat similar to the biblical narrative, but it is a completely different ancient text. We used an old Russian Pelea from the Rumyantsev collection of the State Library. It is a church book. Today it has fallen out of use. I would like to remind you that until the 17th century, for Russian readers it was used instead of the Old Testament. It also covered the New Testament events. At the same time, it significantly supplemented the canonical Gospels that we know today. Note that Pelea was significantly different from the familiar canon of the Old Testament. It was not just a version of the Bible we are familiar with today, but a completely independent book, although it covered the same events as our modern canonical Bible. In the Pelea, we discovered datings of events described in the Gospels. These are indiction dates. It turns out that in the ancient Pelea we discussed, Three indiction dates related to gospel events were found. We briefly talked about what indiction dates were, and you can find more information about them in one of the halls of our museum in Yaroslavl. It was a way of recording dates. Right now, we won't go into the details of how the recording was done. Three cyclical counters were used to record the date with three numbers. In the ancient Pelea from the Rumyantsev collection of the State Library, these three Gospel indiction dates, describing events in the Gospels, allow for one and only decryption and it corresponds to the Gospels and aligns with other independent datings obtained as mentioned earlier. Decoding some of the Pelea dates is strict in the sense that they do not presuppose any errors made by scribes due to carelessness. Therefore, the solution we found through the analysis of these dates is as follows. For the birth of Christ, December 1152 AD is recorded in the Pelea. For the baptism of Christ, January 1182 AD is recorded in the ancient Pelea. And for the crucifixion, March 1185 AD is recorded in the Pelea. This again places it in the mid-12th century, the second half of the 12th century, and precisely corresponds to all the previous datings obtained by various methods. With this, I conclude the discussion of various approaches that lead us to the 12th century, specifically the second half of it, for the analysis of the life of Jesus Christ, also known as Prince Andrei Bogolubsky during his time in Russia, and as Emperor Andronikos Christ, Andronikos Komnenos, during his time in Sargrad. In our next presentation, Anatoly Fomenko will continue to discuss application of the method of form codes. We look forward to seeing you in a week on the channel of the Multimedia Museum of the New Chronology.